these meetings go way back to um, pizza parlors chatting about GIS over some some dinner, and so we've kind of now morphed these into this latest series. So our guest this evening is Dean Angelides, uh, who has worked with thousands of organizations to implement GIS technology to improve their operations and decision making over his 40 year professional career. Over 30 years ago, he co-founded a GIS services company located in California. I think we'll hear more about that. And he joined ESRI in 2005. Dean has worked with many different types of organizations and industries, local, regional and national governments, utilities, transportation and logistics firms, natural resources companies, engineering firms, agricultural concerns, conservation organizations, and health organizations. He's helped them to devise strategies for incorporating GIS into their business and then assisted them to successfully apply new methods to transform their organizations. He's also served on a variety of boards and councils, including the advisory board of the Geospatial Innovation Facility at the University of California, Berkeley, where he did his graduate and undergraduate work, as well as the executive board of the World Geospatial Industry Council. In 2009, Dean was appointed as corporate director by Jack Dangermond with responsibilities for overseeing all aspects of Esri's international business. He's dedicated to ensuring that Esri users are successful in their endeavors and that the science of where and GIS technology and methods are successfully applied to overcome our toughest challenges around the world. And with that uh, introduction, uh, I'd like to offer a little bit of a personal introduction. I met Dean when, he was when I was hired as a rather green instructor at Shasta College in 1996. Dean sat on our GIS advisory committee and was active in RAGU and was, to my recollection, a founding member. In our years working together on these efforts, I was impressed with Dean's insights, his generosity in sharing his knowledge with students and others who were new to GIS and with his prodigious talents. As a principal with Vestra Resources, Dean also provided opportunities for recent graduates of our program, including our own Marcus Harner. I seem to recall that Dean had a property out along Highway 44 on the way out to Palisadro, and I've often thought of him over the years as I pass by, wondering how his career and life have unfolded. So it's with great pleasure that I welcome Dean Angelides to our conversations with North State GIS. And, uh, and maybe, uh, Dean, before we launch in, uh, you can uh, uh, feel free to, to let us know uh, if you would like to run the visuals in any particular fashion. Um, but, uh, but otherwise, uh, let me go ahead and just uh, uh, start off by asking you if you could maybe uh, tell us a little bit about your background, how you got into GIS, your days working at Vestra, and, uh, and how you ended up in Reading. Wow. Well, thanks a lot, Dan. I mean, that was, that was quite the introduction. Uh, you know, I think everything, everything I have to say is kind of downhill from there, but, uh, <laughs> anyway, thanks all for, uh, for getting on tonight. Hopefully you can hear me. Okay. So how did I get to Reading? Well, you know, I think you heard that I, I went to school in Berkeley. I, uh, w was a forestry major, and uh, I ended up working for a company called Southern Pacific Land Company, uh, which uh, some of you don't even know what the Southern Pacific is anymore, but it was a, it was a railroad, <clears throat> Southern Pacific Railroad, and the Southern Pacific Railroad was one of the original land grant railroads. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the development of the West. Um, and it was, uh, you know, initially it was called the Central Pacific Railroad, then it became the Southern Pacific Railroad. And right now, all of the holdings are actually part of the Union Pacific. So in the... Uh, you know, how many of you, how many of you know anything about sort of the development of the West, West of the, uh, of the Mississippi? Yeah. Okay. USGS folks. And 
others surveyors should know um, because it's it's kind of interesting. Uh, so the uh, there was there was some entrepreneurial uh, people interested in developing the West, and so they said, "Well, we're going to build a railroad, but we need some help to do that. We need we need you know how they were like a startup <laughs> at the time." Uh, entrepreneurial startup. And they said, so where can we get investments? So they went to Congress and they said, uh, well, if you guys will loan us the money, we'll build the railroad and we'll pay you back. And at the time, this was right after the Civil War. And uh, the Congress said, well, you know, we, we think it's a great idea, but uh, we're broke. We just finish the civil war, the economy's in shambles. And so we don't have anything to, uh, to, to loan you. We have no money, uh, but we do have land. Uh, and so the public land survey system, which some of you know, um, this subdivided into uh, baselines and meridians, and then townships within those baselines and meridians, and within the uh, the townships, there are sections which are nominally one square mile, one mile by one mile, one square mile, and there's 36 of those in a township. Okay, so Congress said, "Well, we are going to grant you some land." And then you can do whatever you want with that land. You can use the resources that are on the land to help you build the railroad. You can sell it off. You can do whatever you want. Use it to develop uh, areas for yards, for stations. Uh, and they said, well, so how much land are you going to give us? Well, we'll give you 10 square miles, 10 miles on each side of the main line tracks that you, that you build. And they thought, oh, that's interesting. So they gave them the maps of where they were gonna build the railroad. <laughs> and uh, off they went. And they didn't give them contiguous 10 miles on each side of the track. They gave them a checkerboard pattern so if you look at like the national forest maps in the West right now, it still has this checkerboard pattern when you look at that, when you look at that uh, land. So they got the odd sections of land, the odd numbered sections of land. Um, and then the even sections of land remain in government ownership. Uh, so, Interestingly enough, uh, they started off, there was the Union Pacific that was building from Omaha, Nebraska, started in Omaha and built west. And then the uh, Central Pacific started in Sacramento and started building to the east. And of course, you've heard the story of and seen the photos of the Golden Spike uh, that was driven into the ground in Promontory Point, Utah. Well, that's where the two railroads came together. Okay, well, as they were building though, uh, these guys were, they weren't bashful. <laughs> they said, you know, we're in this mountainous territory and uh, you know, it's costing us a lot more to build railroads. So we'd like a little more land. And so in mountainous territory, they ended up with 20 miles on each side of the main line tracks. Okay, well, that's kind of interesting. So they ended up with millions and millions of acres of land, the majority of which they sold off, some of which they kept, um, and some of which they couldn't actually sell off because it didn't have a lot of value at the time. You know, it was just wild land, nothing going on there. So uh, that stayed in the ownership, what was called the outlying lands of the railroad. And Central Pacific became the Southern Pacific. They changed their name. 
And then those outlying lands were held in what was called the Southern Pacific Land Company. Okay, so there you have it, a uh, little history lesson. And so the headquarters for Southern Pacific was one market plaza in San Francisco. Uh, so right at the foot of Market Street in San Francisco is where their headquarters building was. And in fact, for those of you who know Autodesk, uh, Autodesk's design center uh, for the West is now in that building, uh, the same building that, uh, that was the Southern Pacific building at one market. Uh, and in fact, I was there at a couple years ago and uh, I used to go down there in San Francisco and uh, how did I get to Reading? It was a long story. I was working as a forester. Um, my, I was located actually in Grass Valley and we were managing what was known as the Tahoe forestry lands. And uh, this was all checkerboard ownership. And uh, you know we would have cooperative roads with the forest service because every other section you know, you'd go through. So we, there was, it was kind of a crazy way to manage things. But in San Francisco at the headquarters uh, on the eighth floor, which was the executive floor of that building, um, there were the original patents. So this was not just a deed. This was a patent. Uh, it was called a land patent that was granted from Congress to the Central Pacific Railroad. In the with the original signature of Abraham Lincoln, uh, so uh, so there's a story about history of California and the development of the West. Uh, it's also part of my history. Um, it was just incredible to see that. And in uh, San Francisco, they had these huge file cabinets. <clears throat> And they had these uh, Hollerith cards. Okay, so here's some more computer history now. Uh, before there was electronic card readers, um, there was a guy by the name of Herman Hollerith, and he developed a card, and those cards could be encoded. Um, based on the Hollerith code, this 16-bit code. Okay, so 16-bit code is still used today to encode information in, in computers. But before computers, he actually invented it. And he used to have these like uh, card systems. So you could organize the cards and then you could use like a big long knitting needle and you could sort through all these cards based on um, location, based on uh, the type of land that it was, whether it was mining land or forestry land or farming land or oil and gas land. Anyway, so you could go down there and you all the land records were put on Hollerith cards and you could stick the knitting needle in through the cards and you'd pull them up and then, oh, okay. And you'd see all the parcels of land associated with that. So that was the land record system for Southern Pacific Land Company. And then uh, there also was down there a series of section plats. They would be they were called just a plat map. Each section was its own plat. And uh, there was a, an organizing scheme, the same scheme that was used on the Hollerith cards to organize the land records. And um, so we thought, well, you know, we we actually should have a real mapping system. And uh, my former business colleague, Art Stackhouse, um, was actually working on Ah, look at that. There it is. So you can see that checkerboard pattern. It still remains. 
Okay, that checkerboard pattern is uh, is now government land. That's that's one color. The other color is uh, actually private land. Um, and so some of it is owned now by uh, Sierra Pacific Industries. There were a number of other things, but that's a great map right there. Uh, so, uh, boy, more more history. All right. So, yeah, we should we should build a, a mapping system because as young foresters, what we used to do, we used to take the 15 minute series maps, USGS 15, 15, not even seven and a half minute series maps, 15 minute maps, and we'd color them in. And we'd draw draft in manually road systems and we'd draft in the ownership and we'd draft in uh, the various forest cover types. And we said, well, you know, we probably could do a little better than this. And you know, this was, this was long after there were computers. In fact, there was a very large computer center in, in, in downtown San Francisco that we had access to <clears throat> big IBM mainframes. Uh, and so we sort of embarked on this, on this um, journey to build uh, a forest inventory, build automate land records and to uh, build, it was not even called a, a GIS then, um, it was just called a, we just called it a computer mapping system. And uh, so we, we uh, I, I was a young forester, as I mentioned, uh, I was hired in uh, after my graduate work at Berkeley and I worked in Grass Valley and I worked for uh, Art Stackhouse who had moved up to Redding, which was the headquarters of Southern Pacific Land Company Forestry. And, um, and so I was working in Grass Valley and I was responsible for pulling together all of the land records for the lands, Southern Pacific Forestry lands in that Tahoe district, as it was called. And then um, um, we also then had ortho photos flown. And this is before, this was like the old orthos. Okay, how many of you have your, I mean, this is, uh, let's see, it was 1979, actually, when we started all this. So it was aerial photographs that were flown and then there were these great big mechanical ortho photo machines um, that would reconcile the photos based on um, based on a, an operator looking through a set of stereo goggles um, to recreate uh, a set of photographic analog ortho photography. Uh, so then we use that uh, as a base to put on all the section plats. And then the best part was uh, we would go out into the field and we'd find all the section corners. And so we would take and we'd use a pin prick into the, into the photo. Maybe Jim, you remember, maybe you did some of this work, um, finding, finding old property corners, section corners. And so we'd pinprick the photo and then we'd come back and we'd transfer it onto the ortho. And so we made an ortho photo at, this was one to 12,000 photography that we had, aerial photography on a one to 12,000 ortho photo base. Okay, and then we said, wow, okay, now we got a mapping system. And it was all of these sheets, half township, half township, map sheets and it had all the lands on it. And then we began to um, do vegetation classification on the photos. So we identified all of the, we knew where the land was, we knew where the corners were. We would identify where all the vegetation types were, was various types of timber uh, various sizes, various uh, 
mixes of species, conifer mixes and hardwood mixes and conifer hardwoods and different densities. Anyway, you get the idea. And uh, of course, those of you who uh, are thinking about taking the remote sensing class, <laughs> you can make short work of this now. <laughs> But anyway, this was all done manually uh, using, um, you know, stereo viewing, going out in the field, um, and then uh, uh, doing the ground verification. And we built the actual foundation of the mapping system. And so uh, it was in 1980, said, well, uh, you know, there's a couple of companies that ha actual ha actually have computer mapping systems. Uh, this was before Autodesk, um, but there was a company called M&S Computing. M&S Computing became Intergraph, and Intergraph became Hexagon. So Hexagon is today what that was one of the systems. Uh, there was another system called Cinercom, long gone. Uh, there was another system called Esri, Arc Info. And um, we sent a letter to all these and said, well, would you, and there was a, 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 a third company called, um, a fourth company, I should say, called um, Comark. Also long gone. And so we said, well, we'd like to do a little benchmark. <clears throat> we'd like to have you uh, work with us to digitize all these things. We'll digitize four adjacent half township maps. <clears throat> and um, then we're going to see what kinds of uh, maps and analytics you can do for us. And we had a list of all the things that we wanted to do. And so we got letters back. Yes, we will do this. We got a letter back from, um, from uh, M&S Computing, from Cinecom, and from Comark. And then we got a letter from Jack Dangerman. And the letter from Jack was saying, um, you know, we can do this, uh, but honestly, uh, we are building a new system and it's called, uh, it's called Arc Info, but it won't be ready for another year. And so while we know that it will be able to meet your needs in another year, right now, we are not able to participate in the benchmark. Uh, he said it was, he was very, very straightforward. Uh, we know that we will be able to do it. It's all part of what's in our design. Uh, and we could uh, say we can do it now, but we won't. So it was a very straightforward, very honest. And uh, I, I remember that letter. And in fact, I still have that letter from uh, 1980. <laughs> You know, Dean, I was thinking that was a that that's such a great story. And I was thinking, you know, my my intro, I, I mentioned that this talk that I gave the link to was was titled "How Maps Made America." And my follow up question to the author was, was she going to do a follow up called "How Maps Made the American West"? And I was thinking when you were saying that, you know some of what you're describing feels like it's sort of, you know, how maps made the American West in some ways. And, and, you know, do you think it's overstating it to say that, you know, the modern mapping world that we know today really had its, its genesis in the West and some of the things that you were, you were describing? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you, you look at, uh, well, maps have always made the world. In fact, um, back into the, you know, the early days of mapping, the, they were, these were strategic documents um, that kings and governments would hold very tightly. They, they didn't share the maps because it was 
strategically important information that they didn't want their enemies to have. Um, and in fact, you could still say that's true today with, um, you know, let's say the Intel agencies and their, and their mapping technologies. Uh, you know, the, let's say the largest mapping agency in the world is NGA, the U.S. Uh, <clears throat> National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. And um, they share maps only with those who are their allies. And so uh, they have co-production actually of all those maps with their allies. And they, so it's, a, it's, it's very interesting. And so it's still, let's say maps are still, you know, at the foundation of national security, at the foundation of development, at the foundation of pretty much everything we do. Um, but uh, definitely it was a big part of the development of, um, you know, natural resources and the development of, uh, you know, connecting East and West with transcontinental railroad. And then uh, the surveying, you know, I guess maybe it's not the mappers, but the surveyors, you know, actually did that initial public land survey. Well, not everywhere. <laughs> There's some fraudulent surveys that exist, especially uh, in and around Reading. <clears throat> the other thing that it that sort of dovetails in and fits in are the old Spanish land grants. Uh, so Jim knows this very well from, uh, you know, from from building the maps for the city of Reading. You know, you have the you have the old Spanish land grants, you have the intersection of the public land survey and all the subdivisions that happen within that. Um, so uh, all of those things were uh, very much a part of development of the West and, and very much a part of what's going on in Reading, even today. Uh, so from there, uh, we did the benchmark. We bought a Comark system. When I, and, and when we bought that GIS is when I moved from Grass Valley to Reading, and that was in 1984. Uh, so uh, I worked in, I, I lived in Reading, um, actually um, ended up in Palisadro and uh, we uh, built the GIS for the Southern Pacific lands. And uh, as we were doing that, of course, we, we had maps of uh, all of the U.S. Forest Service lands in between, <laughs> and then the management of our the management of our uh, of the group that we worked with uh, at Southern Pacific said, "Gosh, this is amazing! You know, it's like we can see everything on one map." Can you guys put other ownerships on the map? We said, "Well, sure." Uh, so little by little, we started building out. There was something that was called Map of the World. I think those it was turned over, um, you know, went went on to Sierra Pacific when they bought bought the lands. But they would they they kept like complete ownership map of pretty much everything around the holdings. Um, but the real, the real magic was what we had for the forestry lands. And so not only was it tied to, it wasn't just the maps. It was maps and the underlying information about uh, the, the land resources on the maps. And that's where, you know, at that point in time, it was like 1987 when we tied the forest inventory and we had growth and we had growth simulation models. Um, and then we also tied in harvest scheduling, linear programming, harvest scheduling. Remember I said <clears throat> we had these great big monster mainframes down in San Francisco. So we would build these, we would set off tasks, uh, run models and actually make decisions about how to schedule out the harvests for
for sustainable production through time. And so that was that got the attention of uh, a lot of other forest products companies. Um, and so they said, wow, this is pretty amazing stuff. Can you do this for us? So now we got our hands full. We got plenty to do just doing our own property here for the Southern Pacific. Uh, well, anyway, long story short, uh, Southern Pacific Land Company um, got merged in with uh, another railroad land company. And then it became Santa Fe Pacific um, Timber Company. And then they said, well, you know, this is worth a lot of money. So uh, we're going to just spin off those assets. And so they sold off the Timberlands and uh, Red Emerson and the Sierra Pacific purchased all those lands. And they said, well, you know, we have an IT group and we have all these things. So we don't really need you guys. <laughs> And uh, there we were, out of work. <laughs> and uh, we thought, well, you know, a lot of people have been asking us if we can, you know, if we could do this kind of work for them. One of those was Pacific Gas and Electric, PG&E. They had all the lands around the hydroelectric facilities. Um, and um, also uh, the Hearst Corporation. Um, they, they wanted to have a similar kind of system that we built. So we said, well, okay, we don't really know what we're doing. We don't know anything about running a business, but what the heck, let's jump in. And so the group of us that were running the, the forest inventory and actually all of IT at the time, um, we formed up a company. And so there's V-E-S-T-R-A. Uh, v was David Volkman. E was Eric Johnson. We needed a vowel. Uh, S, Art Stackhouse. T, Mark Tepley. R, Tim Riley. And uh, A, uh, as I say, the tail end of Vestra, that's me. So that's where, that's where the name came from. That's uh, sort of the history of how we got started. Uh, a bunch of people that thought it might be an interesting business to get into because there seemed to be a lot of interest. And that was sort of how we founded Vestra and then uh, grew from there, you know, so pretty interesting. And, uh, it's a, it's a great story, Dean. That that the, the, I'm, I'm thinking of all the students that are are. Uh, there's a number of of uh, considerably younger students that are on on the call, and and uh, the whole idea of of having to build, construct a digital land base of ownership. You know, now you just go out to the Esri portal, right, and you just ask for your public lands, and uh, and and you're off and running. Um, you know, I, I wonder if we could kind of step back. You know, you've been doing a bunch of stuff internationally. Um, I'd, I'd love to sit around and chew the fat with you about all the cool places that you've uh, you've traveled to. But but you know, in, in this, you know, it's 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 a bit cliche to talk about you know globalization, the globalized world that we live in, and and whatnot. And you know, this has created opportunities and benefits for a lot of folks and for a lot of businesses, but it's also reinforced wealth disparity and, and resource exploitation in, in some cases. And I'm wondering if you could discuss a little bit about how this fact has, has uh, influenced Esri's approach to its, to its international business. Well, you know, it's, I, I, I'm going to say I really lucked out, you know, in our, first of all, working at Vestra, we became one of the first business partners with Esri. Um, this was in 1988. Um, and so uh, the first, first ever business partner conference, well, it wasn't even called that, it was just a meeting, uh, was held in the San Bernardino Hilton. Um, and there were eight companies, Vestra and seven other companies one of which was Erdos, 
so we had Lori Jordan and um, Bruce Rado were there. Uh, and then a handful of other uh, small companies. And, uh, you know, the, the thought was, well, you know, are you interested in partnering with us to help provide services and uh, help us help us grow, help us grow Esri? And uh, we were thinking about helping ourselves, frankly. <laughs> well, we need a, We need a great GIS. And so, yeah, let's, let's do it. And actually, I, I mentioned that we had acquired the Comark system, but Comark ended up getting a bunch of venture capital, and then they, was, they sold out, and they actually never really did continue on their business. Uh, it's kind of interesting. So it sort of flamed out. And um, uh, so then we, were, we had already put in our budget to replace the Comark software with with uh, Arc Info at the time, Esri Technology. And uh, then we got sold off and we never bought it, but we still made the connections with Jack and Clint Brown and others who, who are still there and my colleagues now. And uh, in, uh, in 1986 actually is when I first met Jack and uh, Clint Brown who is the director of products, he did a demonstration of their, of their system, which actually had, had moved quite, a, quite far along from 1980. And uh, so we were saying, yeah, okay, well, we're gonna, we're gonna get this, we're gonna just transfer our stuff over. They said, oh yeah, we'll be able to take your existing data and we'll migrate it into all this other stuff. But, you know, the, the sort of the early customers of, of Esri were all resource companies, resource companies and actually development companies, companies that owned a lot of land, uh, one of which was mobile, um, Exxon, now Exxon Mobil, and they had all kinds of land and they were wanted to know what to do with it. And so Jack and his landscape architecture, um, he did projects first and looking for um, designing with nature. So it's actually at the core of who Esri is. And in fact, the work that we were doing in forestry, Jack was just like fascinated by it. Yeah, I, I really want you guys to be my partner. <laughs> and so he, he actually helped us out. He, he helped us um, with software. We you know, we, he, he always has helped startups. Now we have a much larger startup program. And so uh, he, he helped us with software. Uh, ultimately, we ended up buying software. And, and I think to this day, Vestra continues to, um, you know, to pay for their commercial software at, at you know, even, even though they're a partner. Uh, so yeah, this is a good slide right here. Here's, here's Esri. Uh, these are the various divisions of Esri all working together. You know, there's operations, you know, obviously these bubbles are not the relative size of, <laughs> of the company, but, you know, primarily we're a software company. Uh, we also provide online services. So there's teams that do that. There's marketing division. There's uh, business development. Uh, there's an international division, which uh, I run. And then there's the extended Esri, which is the rest of um, our international business. So Esri, unlike uh, other companies, IT companies, we actually have what we call international distributors that operate outside the United States. And so um, all those dots on the map are Esri offices, Esri or Esri distributor offices. And so except for the United States, uh, my team and I look after all the other dots on the map. 
And so we have uh, 87 distributor organizations. Uh, they work in 130 countries. And uh, except for countries which are embargoed, there's few countries that we cannot sell into because of US export restrictions. Um, turns out we sold into 201 countries or sovereign territories in, in 2020. So uh, you could say Esri plus our distributors are pretty much a global company and our software is everywhere. I can tell you even in embargoed countries, they love it like Iran. Um, you know, you guys, some of you probably even know, and we, there's a lot of cracked, as it's called, cracked software. Way, But anyway, uh, I went to a conference in UAE, and there was a, there was a, uh, it was a, a geomatics conference, a regional geomatics conference. And there was a, uh, an engineering company from Iran, and they were exhibiting at this, at this trade show. And they had all these as ArcGIS, you know, posters, and you could tell that they were using Esri. And I, I, I kind of went, oh, oh, what's going on here? And they said, well, yeah, we, we love, we love Esri. <laughs> but yeah, it's all cracked because we can't, we can't buy it, but we'd love to be your partner. And I said, well, I'd love to have you my partner, but uh, U.S. government doesn't quite see it that way. So uh, unfortunately, you know, there's a, a black market for crack software, um, you know, but I guess that's okay because they're not using competitive software. They like, they like Esri. And um, so I would say we have software a lot of places and it's after it's, it's my team plus our extended global organization that we call international distributors. Um, these distributors are locally owned and managed. They're independent companies set up. And it was Jack's vision, actually, to find entrepreneurial people uh, who wanted to build a business and were passionate about um, creating a more sustainable future using GIS. So there's a whole culture of of organizations out there all around the world um, that are looking to um, make a difference, uh, build things sustainably, um, make things work better, uh, help people get work done better and be in service of our customers. And so that really is the, the philosophy is, of Esri and we have a culture um, that is eager to do so for um, all of our customers around the world. Uh, NGOs, humanitarian organizations, and things like that. I mean, these were, like I said, Jack was looking for special people as he began to build out this network. And um, so there's always been a focus on conservation. Jack and Laura do grants to conservation organizations. We have very, very low costs. It's, you know, it's like almost free. It's kind of an administrative fee um, for software for uh, nonprofit organizations anywhere in the world. Uh, some of you hopefully are, have gotten uh, personal use software, you know, $100 for the year pretty good deal. All the, pretty much everything you need comes, comes with it. Um, and then startups. So if startups apply to the program, then they can get a three year grant of software. And the thing that's most interesting is the startups are, turns out they're less interested in the software. They're mostly interested in the market. You know, so how do you how do you do this? Either you can get a bunch of venture capital and you sell your life away. That's one way to do it. <laughs> or the other way is you find a way to build up a business 
by creating things, creating real value, selling them, doing services and building a business as you go. That's what we did at Vestra. You know, we took our own, uh, okay, my daughter's college fund, you know, went in to Vestra. And then, uh, <laughs> so I loaned it. And uh, actually all the founders did, did exactly the same. Um, and that's how we ran the company, both on our severance from Southern Pacific. That was part of it. Uh, we had several months of severance and then we had loans and then we had to find work. <laughs> and turns out that one of our first, one of the first projects we had was actually with Pacific Gas and Electric at one of their hydroelectric facilities. Um, so, you know, it was kind of the way how, how to build a business uh, out, of, out of nothing, you know, a little bit of savings and then going to work and doing real work. And so we use exactly the same kind of principles with our startups. <clears throat> These startups are doing all kinds of things um, now. And, uh, you know, so rather than getting a bunch of venture capital, which some of them also do, but um, they can shortcut the time it takes by using, um, using our, our software uh, to create applications and or do services and they start earning money. So they build their business. They, many of them have become quite successful. Some, you know, have sold to larger companies. Some, um, you know, continue to grow on their own and uh, do work in various sectors. Um, some of them are doing uh, uh, work in, in uh, water conservation. Some are doing work in um, water resources. Some are doing work in commercial, you know, in, in uh, like real estate development. Some are doing work for retail um, providers. Some are doing work for, um, they're actually taking sensor information that's out there and they're aggregating the sensor information and creating online services of, of that sensor data for various things. There's a, there was a group of scientists that were at the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena and uh, they developed some technology for, um, uh, for predicting snowpack and runoff and a number of other things. And so uh, using, using uh, various remotely sensed data, they run it through their algorithms, which they've now automated with ArcGIS and they make predictions and they work for organizations all around the world on, uh, on modeling uh, snow melt, glacial melt, all those kinds of things, really primarily aimed at uh, water resource availability. So there's, I mean, it's great. I mean, I just love working with startups um, and we have them all over the world. Uh, India is another place right now. It's like drones are going crazy in India. Uh, India for the longest time was way behind on their, uh, on their geospatial data policies. Um, not every place is like the US where, you know, you can just tap into just about anywhere and you get open data and you just reach out and you get what you need. You bring it into your GIS and you go to work. That's eh, not how it was in India. Uh, data was restricted. And so um, individuals had to create their own data and to have high accuracy data, you had to get a permit from the surveyor general of the government of India. <laughs> so, you know, it's back to that, you know, let's say colonial time where map data was a strategic asset, a matter of national security, but now they've opened it up. And so as they've opened it up, uh, drones, drones are everywhere. They also created a drone policy. 
Okay, so drones are flying and we have a number of startups that are uh, processing that data. They're serving it up. They're providing services of all kinds to uh, land developers, to infrastructure development, to um, uh, water system development, urban development, all that. And also uh, not so much natural resources, interestingly enough, but okay, it's India and uh, right now, they're spending a lot of money developing um, and urbanizing urbanizing the country. You know, Dean, one of the things that you just mentioned, that, that anecdote about India, reminds me of a, uh, an interview uh, on the Mapscaping podcast uh, uh, with the GIO of New York State. And... Um, I'm sure you're aware we've got a, a freshly minted GIO here in, in California. And, and uh, the GIO from New York State was, was talking about how, and, and if you haven't had a chance um, for the audience folks that are out there, you know, check out the state of New York kind of open data site. And it's really quite impressive what's out there. And, and he was really making the case that, um, that cities and municipalities that are not providing easy to access public facing open data sites uh, are really inhibiting themselves in terms of th that a lot of companies, um, developers, others that may be bringing investment into the community simply won't look at you if, if they can't come in and find out, you know, find your parcel base and your land use and, and that sort of thing. And so, so the question I have for you is, is related to, uh, you know, not only uh, the open data concept. Um, and of course, you know, I mean, it's really, it's quite remarkable. I, I love hearing these stories and, and thinking back to those early days. And, you know, I started doing GIS at San Francisco State in about 1990. And, you know, I don't think I registered just how young ARC Info was at that time when we were, when we were starting. And then thinking about, you know, Jim and his days at, at the city and, and all that work trying to just build up this, this uh, you know, foundation of, of spatial data. And now, you know, City of Reading has this great uh, um, open data site where you can access all this data. Uh, shout out to, to Devin and Steve Kincaid and, and their team for, for, for what they've done on that site. And, uh, you know, so, so there's that side of it, but then the other side of it, which I, I was hoping to get you to speak to is some of the recent trends in the free and open source software side of things and kind of how that's kind of affected the business and sort of where you see, you know, how Esri sort of responding to, to some of those trends. Yeah, well, Esri, you know, it's like open source, open source is there. Um, and it's gaining in popularity. And honestly, that's okay for us. Um, the, uh, you know, what it does is it, it provides access, easy access for anyone to be able to, to have the GIS tools. I mean, a lot of these things, of course, are, let's say they were, they're knockoffs of, of Esri, you know, software, you know, people would copy it. Um, and then they develop other little things. And then, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a really interesting ecosystem and way of, of getting work done. Um, sometimes it's a hobby for people. Sometimes it's, uh, it's the only way that they can afford to get what they need. Uh, and actually, that has helped us even to understand better that um, you shouldn't have to be wealthy to uh, be able to have ArcGIS. And that's where, why Jack started these uh, nonprofit programs. And of course, education, he's always been very generous with education software um, and to uh, conservation organizations and so on. Um, the, it's it's kind of interesting, though, to really... You know, I mean, there's QGIS that you can sort of, you just download and use it. That's good. Um, if, if that's what you really need. Does that slow down sometimes um, the use of, of Esri technology? Yes, it does. But honestly, there's so much more that needs to be done that uh, I would say 
it hasn't really impacted Esri's business. I would say it's impacted Esri's business in a positive way because it's just more people that are geospatially aware. And um, many times you'll end up selling in, selling in with uh, using open source information as well. I mean, obviously there's interoperability with this software. Um, I would say some of the more advanced things are not there. Um, <clears throat> and now with, um, with 3D integration, with integration with uh, other, with all remotely sensed information, with um, um, integration with CAD and BIM. Okay, CAD, yes, BIM, not so much. I mean, these are sort of more forward-looking things that um, are not necessarily uh, readily available in open source. And so you, you personally, if you're going to use open source, either you have to be part of a group that has some very capable developers or, uh, <laughs> you know, you have to, you have to really want to develop stuff to be able to use open source because it's, it's, it's the open source, you know, it's like not a product. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. So. You know, I, I heard somebody I, I thought spoke to it very well by by describing a false dichotomy between you know sort of Esri and open source, whereas really, as you as you pointed out, I mean it's sort of part of this evolving uh, geospatial ecosystem, and you know to our benefit, I mean it, it's really quite remarkable to realize how ubiquitous. Uh, spatial data and, and, you know, spatial data tools have become, right? And uh, it, it's an interesting world to be in. I, th I think it, it keeps, you know, I keep hoping that it's going to uh, help keep my mind sharp that, you know, I've thrown so many conceptual curveballs to try to stay ahead of the, the game with just where things are going. And, and uh, I, I wonder if you would care to, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, put out your crystal ball and, and uh, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of these discussions going on within, within Esri, you know, where, where do you see us 10 years from now? Well, uh, now GIS and GIS is going to be everywhere. I'll just put it that way. It's already a lot of places, uh, but it's going to be, it's going to be much more ubiquitous than it is today. I think we just we just lay that out. Uh, Jack has a vision for GIS as the nervous system of the planet. And if you kind of think about that, um, what does it actually mean? It means that you have systems that are working together you have sensors throughout that system. Those sensors uh, sense and provide information. There's some type of computing. The computing might be done, uh, yeah, the computing might be done locally. It might be done in a device, it might be done in the cloud, uh, but everything is connected everything is considered before decisions or actions are taken. And that is where we're headed. So right now we have this concept of right there, that's the perfect slide, geospatial infrastructure. So, uh, you know, you say, what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen with the electric grid over the next decade? Well, it's gonna dramatically be rebuilt and uh, will we need all the, you know, long distance transmission lines? Well, probably for 20 years, uh, but after 20 years, we probably won't need it because we're gonna have distributed generation resources. We're gonna have microgrids. We're gonna have batteries. We're gonna have electric cars. We're gonna have, you know, it's gonna totally transform. So how, how will that infrastructure be run? Well, 
it's going to be run <laughs> with geospatial systems. So alongside the operational system, there's going to be a geospatial system. And that's where this concept that's rolling out now called digital twin, you probably heard that in sort of growing, uh, growing frequency. You know, it initially started having a digital twin actually was, I think that term was first coined by General Electric. And it was, it was for aircraft engines. She said, we can't afford to have an aircraft engine fail. <clears throat> so we're going to build a digital twin of that. We're going to have sensors, telemetry, and we're going to tie that in with predictive analytics for maintenance of those engines. Okay, and that's probably a decade ago where they began that. So it sort of is a term that came out of um, industry and then they applied it to electric turbines and they applied it to other you know, industrial equipment. Uh, now we're talking about digital twins of buildings. And so I have not just the BIM of that building uh, but I also have the digital twin for all of the systems and how everything operates inside. Okay, then you say, well, I want to extend that digital twin concept into the digital twin of a city. Okay, so it's tied in with transactional data. It's tied in with IoT data. It's tied in with 3D spatial and temporal data, 4D data. Uh, it's a complete model of a place and all of the physical and natural environment. And it's real time. And you can access it from, access it from anywhere. And you can model it in a variety of different ways, depending on what your interest is. So in light of the fact that, you know, we've got uh, students that are, you know, some of them are just sort of cutting their teeth with, uh, as I like to say that they've just learned how to spell GIS, you know, they're just kind of getting oriented that way. Um, but also maybe you could extend that a little bit to early GIS career professionals, you know, in terms of what kind of advice would you give to those folks for how to, you know, kind of take that next step and keep, keep developing if it's something that they find interesting. And Well, you know, I guess the first advice is uh, do what makes you happy. Um, so, uh, somehow all this made me happy. I'm not quite sure why it's sort of this, um, um, melding together, you know, history and how things really work <clears throat> and, um, being able to, um, integrate information from all different places. I mean, that in a, in a sense, that's the real value of GIS. Uh, it's not about visualization, even though that's what people first relate to. The real value is about integration of information. And then the modeling of that to make things work better. I mean, that actually is the thing that really made me happy. I mean, we, you know, it's like I went from coloring in the wintertime maps uh, to being able to predict where in the next 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, there would be different types of timber and whether there would be enough wildlife habitat for spotted owls and whether it'd be enough habitat for other creatures and whether or not water resources were being protected. And so it's like, you can, you can do it all. <laughs> that's, that's the thing that really got me excited. I can do it all. You know, it's not this or that. It actually allows you to do it all. So in terms of human endeavor, 
you know, it's always like this. Um, um, there's always this, well, I can develop or I can conserve. Well, I guess it's somewhat true um, with, with a built environment. But at the same time, it's like I can build in a way that's also conserving. Okay, so, so it's okay, you know, I mean, we as humans, we're, we're, we got a big footprint on this planet, and it's growing. So how do we actually do better uh, at what we're doing? Um, so I would say, you know, do what makes you happy, you know, and there's many pathways. Uh, but for me, I was, I was a forester. Okay, so I enjoyed being outside. I enjoyed um, the whole notion of, um, you know, working, working in the woods. I enjoyed understanding uh, forest ecosystems. I also enjoyed the heck out of big equipment that was used in logging. <laughs> you know, you'd cut a tree and, you know, kaboom and, you know, haul it out of the woods with big equipment. And, you know, and you'd look and you go, oh my God, that's devastating. And then, well, okay, now we're going to put some trees back there. And that's going to grow into another forest. Okay, well, you know, depending on your time frames and how you actually manage, it's, you know, this is this is good stuff. So for me, um, it was about really making things work better, making incremental improvements in in how I did my work and how I could help others do their work, and ultimately contribute to a world that was more sustainable. Um, and, and so for those of you who are sort of looking to find your way, you know, what are the, you know, where, where are good opportunities? <clears throat> okay, for me, uh, I was raised in a way that, um, you know, it's like, okay, you, you gotta go work. You know, my mother was a taskmaster. She, uh, she made sure I was busy all the time doing something. <laughs> uh, and, and so, uh, you know, but I was interested in a lot of things. And, and, and so I was also interested in the interrelationships of things and how one thing impacted another thing. And then uh, when I got into, um, you know, into the university, um, you know, we had this whole multiple use, you know, the national forests were being managed for multiple use. You know, so where, where are areas that are most, inter that, are, that are most suited for having a campground? Where are areas that are most suited for conservation and preservation? Where are areas that are most suited for wildlife habitat? Anyway, I mean, these are Big, big questions, all the where questions. Well, those where questions exist in every area of human endeavor. And the interrelationships exist everywhere. So for me, it was about understanding those relationships and making things work better. Uh, others may have other things that, are really, that, are, that really drive them, but that's what drove me. Um, no, maybe my mother drove me. <laughs> and, uh, so I, I have to credit my mother, you know, because she's the one that did it to me. Um, but, but I, but she, she made, she made me work and I found things working together very interesting. And so that's how I pursued it. And that's how forestry was, you know, just as a, as a profession. You know, you need to understand geology. You need to under soils, understand soils. You need to understand weather and climate. You understand biology. You need to understand ecology. You need to, you know, I mean, it's, it's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of science. There's also engineering. And there's also pure enjoyment of being out in the woods on a beautiful spring day. Okay, so, so I, had, I had it all. Then it's like, okay, now we're going to try to manage this place better. 
it's like, wow, here's this cool technology that actually allows me to not spend my winters on coloring projects, but to every day go in and be able to make professional decisions about how to manage this place better. Okay, so as a, as a student, you know, things that are interesting to you, um, working, working in, a, in an urban environment, okay. Um, you know, one of the big things, you know, back, gosh, long time ago, stormwater permitting, you know, okay, it sounds, sounds pretty uninspiring, but it's inspiring as can be. Where does all the water from the city go? You ever, you, you know, it's like, you don't think about it, but it's like, wow, that's a, that's a big problem. <laughs> and then what runs off uh, in that water. And uh, so then we better go out and inventory all those things. So it was like, there's, there's still jobs out doing those kinds of things. So there's all kinds of field inventory. If you like to work outside, there's just many, many, many options for field work. Um, so find an area that interests you. There's field work. You can take GIS with you and it will, you know, and it will make your life better. Just as an individual working out there. And by the way, it will make uh, the management of those assets that you're working on also work much better. Uh, take the same thing in the natural environment. Take the same thing in agriculture. Take the same thing in retail business. Say, take the same thing in the financial uh, industry. Take the same thing in, um, uh, well, pick a profession and it's geospatial. Some part of it is. So um, I'm not saying that, you know, just always do geospatial, but find those things that are interesting to you. And for the most part, geospatial will be part of it more and more and more uh, because we are instrumenting the whole environment little by little, whether it's remotely sensed, whether it's from sensors on equipment, whether it's from, you know, I mean, how many sensors are in these things? I don't even know. You sense everything. <laughs> well said, Dean. I, you know what I heard you say, you know, of course, you know, the follow what you love. And I, I, I too feel very fortunate to, uh, to be doing work that I love to do, but something else that you said that I think is really important, which is, work hard, you know, you gotta, you gotta put that time in. And I think especially like in the world of, of geospatial, um, there's so much information out there to be gleaned and to understand and whether it's through reading or podcasts or taking classes or whatever it is. And, and forums like this, where you can interact with other uh, folks that are in the field and learn things, I think is, is especially important. But, but I think also you touched on something, which is that, um, you know, geospatial is, is a big tent these days and you can have, you need those folks that can do that heavy lifting tech kind of work. Um, but you also need folks that just understand what GIS can do and can speak to the board of directors or the board of supervisors or, or whoever it is. And I think those are the, those are the things that, that I think are, are, uh, Part of what and, and part of what makes it so interesting, of course, is as you said, is it it roots us in the world that we live in. So under unlike you know um, other sorts of uh, a lot of other tech endeavors that might not allow you to have that connection to the physical world that we live in, geospatial keeps us keeps us anchored in there. Devin uh, has a question, I think, from the uh, from the chat that he was going to start off <clears throat> with and. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, I, I couldn't end the meeting without at least taking one question from Jim. And he had asked, I think, earlier about some, maybe some of your first projects. I think your first city, your first county, Jim. I don't know if you want to elaborate on that question a little bit, but 
I thought it might take us a little bit full circle to, to hear a little bit about that. I think it was Contra Costa County. Contra Costa right. County was Contra Costa County was probably one of the first real urban urbanized. Well, that's not true. We did some work with uh, Washoe County, Nevada, uh, but it wasn't quite as in depth as what we were doing with Contra Costa County. Um, and there, um, it's kind of interesting. We ended up working. We we actually learned a lot about local government. Uh, and who does what. And sort of the big problem they had there was addressing. You know, it's like, it's like everybody was fighting over the addressing. It's like, well, you can't give that an address. It doesn't have a actual parcel yet. Yeah, but I need an address because I have to send people there to provide services and everything should have an address. <laughs> so we, we actually started by mapping all of the different departments and why they needed an address. And, uh, and so uh, we also had like this, this timeline of when they actually needed the address. And then you had everybody that was, that was angry with the planning department because they were the ones that were supposed to assign that and assign the address. And they said, well, until we actually have a real subdivision and a this and a that, we can't assign an address. But it's like everybody needed, and half of the county needed addresses before the planning department would uh, would actually assign it. So I guess this is a, this is a long story to say, to say that um, part of this was understanding the various needs that government actually has. And it's just phenomenal. Just um, the misconceptions that everybody had about why the planning department wouldn't, you know, <laughs> wouldn't give them an address. <laughs> So, so uh, we helped to resolve that, okay? And part of that was that, well, it's a place, you know? So let's, let's just give it a place and uh, you can call it an interim address. And so is there a system that you can actually, you can assign this thing that would give it an address that would actually, you could, it would stick and it would actually serve everybody's needs, but you could do it way at the front end here before you have all the rest of the subdivision work done? The answer is yes. Um, so, so we were solving a big problem and we applied geography to that problem, um, but it wasn't really the geography that everybody valued. It was like, it was the planning department was just like, they were so happy. People are not pissed off at us all the time now because, <laughs> because they think we're not giving them an address because we're power hungry or something. You know, so it's like it's like all of a sudden people started getting along. All right. So it's a anyway, so Contra Costa County, I would say, was was a real breakthrough for us as as Vestra because um, we helped, we were there to help solve all kinds of problems. And we were just using GIS as a tool to help us uh, improve the understanding across the county. And so ultimately, you know, GIS was used in almost every department in the county. And so uh, it was it was great. And so we, you know, we, you know, our best friends became the planning department. Um, and um, and actually, initially. We were, we were working for emergency management because the emergency management and the first responders are the ones that had to have the address. Well, there's guys building out there, but they don't have an address. So where am I, where are we gonna go respond to? You know, somebody got hurt on the job. This was actually before, you know, cell phones and GPS and all that stuff. So nobody knew how to get there. So they needed a road and they needed an address. 
Okay, so it was emergency first responders that actually drove it. And that was how we ended up sort of working our way through the whole county on out through the water agency and everything else. Good answer. Yeah, it was great because I happen to know from working with Jim that, you know, City of Reading was big on assigning addresses to empty parcels. I, I work somewhere now where that, that hasn't been the practice. And as we look towards things like Next Gen 911, where, you know, we want to standardize addressing across the entire nation, uh, this just becomes far more important. So it's a great, uh, great question and great, great answer. Um, I have one more. And this is from Marcus. This is, uh, does Esri have a local government digital twin example or guide to start to build build them in future years? So maybe Marcus, if, you, if you're on, if you want to elaborate on that a little bit, you're thinking maybe a, a digital twin of a local government to build are a GIS there, or to build a city? Kind of, are there examples? Um, I guess this digital twin thing is uh, so we can build our county and then run models of how it will work and and tweak little settings and stuff or um, is there a, a naperville example that's always been the example of everything um yeah. do they have one <laughs> no not yet okay. um and i would say honestly we're you know the the there's a concept called digital twin you know it had to do with uh, predictive maintenance on jet engines. Uh, that's where it came from. And so the notion of a digital twin that, let's say, well, and there's many different definitions for digital twin. Some will call just a, let's say, a 3D city model a digital twin. Now, okay, that's, to me, that's only... That's just one part of a digital twin. That's the visual representation of it. And so you'll end up with digital twins for many different purposes. So I think you'll have a planning, well, just like addresses. I mean, addresses where this is this incredible unifying principle. And so now instead of just addresses, we'll have other unifying principles and it will be, it will be managed inside of a GIS because GIS is the ultimate integration uh, mechanism. That's my perspective. Okay. Um, and, and so um, we are working on a number of digital twin projects, I would say right now. Um, one of which is in, um, uh, in Hong Kong, another one in Singapore. Um, so it's actually not here in the U S I mean, we're U S is, uh, you know, we're trying, still trying to get addresses for crying out loud, <laughs> but <laughs> there are, these are big vertical high density cities that have a lot going on. And, uh, and so they're, they're trying to bring understanding and better coordination and more efficiency and um, in, into the way that they create urban environments and the way that they operate the urban environments and have great places to live and great economies that support everyone who lives there. So uh, I need lots of integrated information and having a 2D map does nothing there. So initially it started as 3D and a lot of the 3D capabilities that we have today are actually driven in large part by uh, work that was done in, in Singapore uh, and, and Hong Kong. <clears throat> so we, we ended up partnering with uh, URA, Urban Redevelopment Authority in Singapore for some of the first um, 3D work. Um, actually, it's done now, but we have a 3D cadaster for the city of New York. Okay, so 3D property records. It's all 3D. That's good for New York. You know, is it that important for Reading? Eh, not so much. 
Uh, but anyway, you get the idea that because of all of these other places that we work, we're able to, to you know, uh, sort of advance the technology, take these concepts, and then start to bring them to life. But I would say digital twin is early days. Um, and so let's say they're sort of the conceptual uh, set of ideas. But then there's the what's the practical work that people are going to do with, um, with a digital twin. So there's digital twins for transportation. There's digital twins for buildings. There's digital. And right now, there's sort of these individual digital twins. Uh, but within GIS, you can integrate everything. Okay, so uh, right now there's no, we, we actually don't have any customers anywhere that want to do that. Uh, it's just little bits at a time and everybody's got different priorities. So uh, I, I think, let's say the technology will support it for the most part. Uh, we still don't really have integration with all of the predictive models that are used in a city, for instance, or an urbanized environment. It's a lot of different, I mean, think about that. Can I parameterize everything and model everything in a city? Hmm. I don't think so, not yet. Uh, but, you know, we're, work, we're working towards it. You know, I'd say that's the, you know, in 10 years, every, city's, every city GIS is going to be what we, we conceive of a digital twin today. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, really appreciate your time, Dean. And, and uh, it's been great to have you. And uh, be on the lookout for the next, next couple meetings. And uh, you, you all have a great night. Yeah, thanks for having me, everyone. <laughs>